Hey, welcome friends, family, and anyone else to the webinar. We are glad you're here. We're titling this the Halftime 2022. Typically do this at the end of, of every summer. Uh, I am Matt Price with the Price Group. Randy, you try to say he's my older brother. He's actually my father. He is out of town uh, back tomorrow. Maybe he's back on Thursday for a, a ministry him and my mom are involved in. So he sends his regards of not being able to make it, but we put this information together. Uh, both of us put this together. So uh, he's, he's keenly aware of what we're gonna be talking about. So tailwinds becoming headwinds. Thought that was semi catchy. And uh, we think really a theme thus far in 2022 for what we have seen in the economy, in the financial markets, and uh, we'll also be talking about where we think we might be going from here. So uh, 30 to 45 minutes, we'll have the trains running on time, everyone out of here in a punctual fashion. Uh, do this. We've gotten a lot of great questions from clients and friends uh, after the webinar. We're not going to be able to talk about everything in extreme detail. So shoot us an email, give us a call if there's anything you want to do. Uh, talk about in more detail, please let us know. And, and that's helpful for us on when we're planning these, what to try to tailor the next presentation toward and make sure we spend some more time on that. But our goal is we want to do these quarterly. So this is our third uh, market update of the year. And we'll probably have one more right around the election sometime uh, early, middle of November would be my best guess to, to talk about what changes uh, uh, any any decisions made in Washington might have on the economy, the markets as a whole. So here we go. Uh, who are we? For those of you that are not as familiar with us, we're the Price Group, family owned and operated, 45 plus years of experience between the both of us. Uh, we follow a fiduciary standard. We think that is really important. It's hard to believe we've been here at Steward Partners, our firm, for uh, closing in on five years. I mean, in some ways it feels like it's been forever. In some ways it feels like it was just yesterday. But uh, us joining Steward Partners, a big part of that was being able to serve as a fiduciary for our, our clients. Uh, retirement niche, we actually did the math. Uh, 82 to 83% of the clients that we serve are retired. The other, call it 15 or 20%, are, are closing in on retirement. So uh, Randy has has a very limited arsenal of jokes, uh, and unfortunately, I think I've inherited that gene from him. But one of the jokes we'll use, if you have a heart issue, you don't want a doctor that does gallbladders on Monday, big toes on Tuesday, and knees on Wednesday. You want a guy that focuses on hearts every day of the week. And in our humble opinion, we think the same holds true with retirement planning. You don't want someone that Eh, might do retirement on Monday, might help some some kids right out of college on Tuesday. You want you want someone that really eats, breathes, and sleeps retirement planning. And, and so that's who we are, a team of five people here. Maddie Kearns uh, getting his CFP certified financial designation earlier this year has become a real integral part of our team. And for, for clients that have not spoken with him, I'm sure you'll be getting to speak with him soon. Uh, we've been humbled. Barron's, Forbes, Financial Times have gotten some recognition from them. Uh, Randy and I both went to Wharton to get our SEMA, Certified Investment Management Analyst designation. We have three CFPs or Certified Financial Planners on our team. Uh, bottom line is this, we think education is really important. We, we spend copious number of hours every year with continuing education to keep up with this. And uh, so, it, it's easy to get into our business. It's a lot harder to become certified and have designations and keep up with them. And uh, so we, we think that's important from a client perspective. A little bit about our firm. Uh, for those of you, this might be a refresher. Some of you, maybe this is new. Uh, one of the key salient differences that we're really proud of, uh, Steward Partners, we're not owned by a bank. So we think that's really important. The firm is employee owned. It's very familial in, in how we uh, look at things. Uh, there's there's 26 billion plus dollars of client assets, so it's not some boutique firm. 
uh, our, where company assets are held, our custodian, Raymond James, very fiscally conservative. They've been a great partner. Uh, we've really enjoyed working with them, but they're one of our vendors. So here's our agenda for the day, the economy, financial markets, and what may, may be ahead. So without further ado, let's, let's jump in. The, the economy, let's take a step back here and look at what has happened over the past, call it two-ish years or so. The fiscal stimulus has played a big part in, in the stock market moving higher, the economy expanding really since, uh, call it summer of 2020, right after COVID or right in the, the middle of COVID. And Congress and their infinite wisdom, and I say that tongue in cheek, decided it was necessary to spend almost $6 trillion, trillion with a T, dollars and put money into individuals' pockets with the hope that they would go out and stimulate the economy. So uh, people have said, well, we get this quote unquote free money. Well, we can guarantee this. That money was not free. It's being paid for by, by some taxpayers now, but our children and our children's children for generations to come. So we're really in uncharted territory on the government spending this amount of money in such a short period of time. Uh, couple that with some monetary policy. Uh, the Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, who you see probably speaking on CNBC every now and then, he, one could argue, is the most powerful man in the world from a standpoint. He controls the money supply. He controls what these short-term interest rates are doing. And, and they had very accommodative policy, meaning they brought interest rates down to zero, made borrowing for companies a lot cheaper, and uh, it essentially was very pro-business with how much money was out there sloshing around in the economy looking to invest or people looking to invest. So two, two big positives from a, from a 2020 to maybe uh, first quarter of this year timeframe. COVID cases obviously have slowed. And then there was up until earlier this year, a lot of geopolitical stability uh, across the globe. So with that, those are the, the tailwinds. Uh, and we'll talk here in a minute about how some of those tailwinds have really morphed over the past six to nine months into headwinds. Here's a look, a little bit of a busy chart. This is the gross domestic product or the GDP. This would be a, a holistic look at the economy here in the United States of, of the total output. So this is a figure you'll hear talked about. Is the economy growing or is it shrinking or is it moving sideways? This typically is the figure they are referring to. Draw your attention to the, the, the two real kind of volatile lines here. This was spring of 2020 followed by uh, the, the end of 2020. And uh, since then, you've seen some, some slightly above average growth since the end of COVID which makes sense. Uh, the first quarter of this year had, had actually a negative GDP print. And then the second quarter had a negative GDP, GDP print as well. So the, the technical definition of a recession is two straight quarters of the economy contracting, which according to the textbooks, that is what we're in right now. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in one minute, but the economic data tells a different story. Uh, the, the manager's index, the ISM purchasing manager's index is above 50. Typically when that's above 50, the economy's expanding. When it's below 50, it's contracting, still above 50. Jobs growth is still really strong. It's an employee market, meaning these employers are having a hard time finding people to fill their open positions. The number of vacant uh, positions uh, uh, is, is still breaking records. Uh, the unemployment rate is still low, about three and a half percent. And consumers are still spending. You look at the, the travel and entertainment spending uh, over the last 12 months, it is one of the highest years on record. Part of that is People felt cooped up for a year, year and a half with, with COVID, but uh, we think overall the consumer's in great shape. Companies are in great shape. Uh, now, does that continue forever? 
the obvious answer would be no, but for the time being, it, it's, it's a little bit of a head scratcher on why the economy has shrunk for two straight quarters when all this other economic data continues to be positive. Uh, the, the, partially a joke, but this is actually true. The White House tried to change the definition of a recession a few weeks ago, uh, and that definition of a recession has been used for uh, for, for hundreds of years. So it, it's it, it's kind of one could argue or or think, I guess speculate, it has something to do with the midterm elections coming up in November. But I'll let you be the judge of that. Here's a breakdown of the first quarter of the GDP, and I think this tells a little bit, maybe partially answers our question on on well. Matt, you're saying that that this number, this GDP number, is is negative, but you're saying all these other numbers are good. What 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 did it was it comprised of? You can see the consumer spending was was positive, business investment was up, government spending is down, and then the big piece, net exports, was down a whole lot. The net exports would be anything that our country, the U.S., is producing and selling to other other parts of the world. Uh, the the reason for that, the U.S. recovered at a, a much quicker pace than the other developed countries as it pertained to, to COVID. You're still seeing a lot of COVID lockdowns in China, obviously, uh, the geopolitical tension, Ukraine, Russia. Other parts of the world have not fared as well over the past 12 months as the U.S. has. Thus, these other countries are not buying as many products from, from these U.S.-based companies. So I don't know if this is necessarily a comprehensive answer, but I think it is at least a, a good shot at helping to explain why this is, why GDP is down, yet the economy as a whole still looks rather healthy when we look under the hood. Here's a quote. Uh, the story is fairly straightforward. The Omicron wave, the war in Ukraine, and the new lockdowns in China took a greater toll abroad than here at home. So I think that, that kind of speaks to what we, we just had said. But transition a little bit into the tailwinds becoming headwinds. Obviously, the last six, nine months of, of this year, geopolitical instability, uh, the China lockdowns continue to, to essentially affect the global economy. Had a good question from a client last week, actually, and, and they said, Matt, why, why should we be concerned about the, the lockdowns in China? And, and I thought, you know, that's a good, that's a really good intuitive question, but it, it's twofold. Number one, China is a big buyer of a lot of American goods. We saw just a slide ago, those net exports, what America is sending out is lower. China is, is obviously a big buyer of a, a lot of things that we produce. And then on the flip side, we are big buyers of things that the, the Chinese economy produces. Uh, probably a lot less dependent than we were two or three years ago, but still purchasing a lot of goods from, from China. And so with that being said, with their, their uh, so many lockdowns in so many different cities, their output, what they're producing has moved lower it's a big part, not the whole reason, but a big part of the supply chain shortages you're seeing with chips, with cars, with, you know, go down the list of different things you're, you're seeing uh, uh, out there right now. I had a, a, a colleague who he owns a, a family business actually making some Play-Doh, and they, they have this Play-Doh that they purchased from China and historically, it's taken anywhere from three to four months for them to get the product after it gets on the freight delivered to their warehouse here in Houston. Uh, he said that they are now, with a three to four month normal lag time, they're almost at a year. He said 10, 11 months is their expectation of how long it's taking to get product move from the purchase to them receiving it. So stuff like that is, is obviously going to drive up prices in this one specific example, just with the uncertainty of how much are they going to have. So it, it's a cascading effect on, on, on what that does overall to, 
to, to our economy here. Uh, the fiscal stimulus ends, uh, the quote unquote free money, and I say that tongue in cheek, those checks have stopped coming. Uh, and, and the Fed, the Federal Reserve, that is Mr. Powell, has gone from a very loose or a very easy monetary policy to a more conservative or tightening policy. So we'll, we'll talk we'll talk more about that, but we don't think we're we're the, right now tight. We're probably back to a uh, more normal type of of interest rate policy. And, and so the, the market being down the last two, three days, the, one of the main reasons for that, Mr. Powell said that there could be more room for rising interest rates, meaning we're, we're gonna make sure we tackle inflation. That's their primary concern. And uh, so the, the market did not like, like that news last Friday and then has, has kind of flown over into next, this week as well. So these have been the headwinds we would say for the last, call it six months or so. Uh, and with that being said, the last piece there, the monetary policy, let's talk briefly about inflation because that's a big component of this monetary policy and what the Federal Reserve we think will uh, end up, how they're gonna be making their decisions on how tight do they make this, this policy moving forward. But you can see here, this is a look at the uh, uh, one of the ways that inflation is measured, the PCE price index, uh, you know, another one that everyone's heard of, probably the, the CPI, the consumer price index, very similar. And you see month by month, you, you're, you're seeing a slight, ever so slight reduction if you exclude food and energy, and you're seeing more of a, a less increase and more of a flat number if you include food and energy. So at the beginning of this year, our uh, thoughts were that inflation would increase the first six months of the year and would start to, to oscillate. And then hopefully that last quarter of this year start to slightly move lower. So we're, we're still waiting to see if that will happen. Uh, one of the big metrics for, for inflation is the money supply out there in the economy. And, and this, this fiscal stimulus ending, that's a big component of the money supply, but you saw the money supply spike 2020, 2021 with all these checks, and you're seeing that money supply start to come in. So typically inflation does follow how, how much money is out there or if the money supply is contracting we don't think inflation is put a check mark next to it and it's all taken care of. We think this problem probably persists for a while, but we don't, we're, we continue to believe we don't think there's going to be runaway inflation like we saw in the 70s. Uh, the Mr. Powell, the Federal Reserve, has been very adamant that their primary concern is getting inflation back under control. Consumer sentiment, people are continuing to feel very pessimistic about the economy, about the world as a whole. And, and there's, there's good reason for that. This is a little bit of a busy chart, but what you can see here, people are the most nervous or uneasy dating all the way back to spring of 2009 or the end of 2008 during the, the financial crisis. And and it's a little bit perplexing. The, the world, you know, kind of shook and was capitalism as we know it going to end based on what was happening in 2008, 2009. Here, here we, we think it's a little bit different story, but uh, there's a whole, whole generation of people who really haven't lived through an inflationary environment. If you're 45 or younger, you've really never had any type of uh, long-term inflationary environment. I uh, had a, probably said this before on one of these webinars, but we had a, a client who passed a number of years ago, very, very sweet lady. And I was trying to say about two years ago, I called her by name and said, hey, Mrs. Client, interest rates could move higher. And she said, sweetheart, 
I've been retired longer than you've been alive. Interest rates are not going to move higher. And, and she was right. She'd been retired for, for over 40 plus years when she, uh, when she did pass. But uh, she'd become accustomed over multiple decades of interest rates just moving lower, lower, lower. And she, she was right for a very long period of time. Uh, so that, that being the biggest reason for why people are feeling pessimistic, obviously other reasons, political instability, the, the war uh, that continues with Russia, Ukraine, what will China do? Or will there be any type of skirmish with China as well? Uh, time will tell. But here, here's a look at how inflation affects the way people think and spend. And, and you're seeing this with a lot of company earnings that have come out here over the past few weeks, but some of these more uh, value type companies, for example, Walmart, who offers or, or claims to offer things at a, uh, a lower price, you're seeing those type of earnings hold up really well. People have said, you know what, instead of shopping at, you know, pick a more high-end grocery store, a Whole Foods, I'm going to go and look at the produce at Walmart and hopefully save a few dollars. So you're seeing people slide down the scale of what is perceived uh, value looking for a better, better price. Uh, so that, that's a big component, delaying purchasing plans, saving less, driving less. And, and then actually, I, I'm guilty of this last one, buying products in anticipation of prices going up. I've gotten a number of emails from, one of them was our people we buy our dishwasher soap from and a couple of others where they said, hey, we're, we're going to be raising prices at the end of this month. And so I went ahead and just ordered two extra, uh, knowing that the prices would be higher by the next time I order. So you, you see a lot of that, but inflation really can affect the how, how people, the psyche, how people are thinking about their money. And uh, thus far, the good news is the consumers are cons continuing to spend. And uh, here's a good quote. The situation has become turned inflationary psychology. Consumers advance their purchases in order to beat anticipated future price increases. Firms will pass along those higher costs to consumers, including the future cost increases they anticipate. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it, you're, you're seeing that happen. Thus far, consumers have held up their end of the bargain, meaning they have not shied away from purchasing altogether. They've probably changed their purchasing habits a little bit to become a little more economical or thrifty or whatever word you want to use uh, there. So uh, at some point, we think that changes. But uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that and, and our earnings expectations for companies here over, over the next couple of quarters as well. Uh, here's a look, the Fed, the Federal Reserve is tightening their monetary policy. The, the big bar on the right, 1980 to 1981, that's Mr. Volcker, what he did, the former Fed chair, probably one of the most famous names uh, known when, when talking about the Federal Reserve, increased sh short-term interest rates to 20% to just crush inflation. And in the other bar charts are, are kind of a walk through the end of last year through what's estimated the end of this year. And, and uh, you see that it's nowhere near where we were in the 80s. Uh, I, I say this a lot, but humans, including Randy and myself, we're all linear thinkers. And so we have this recency bias thinking, you know, here in Houston, it's rained every day for the past week. And, I can catch myself thinking, oh my goodness, is it ever going to stop raining? But just a month ago, we were talking about, well, it, it hasn't rained in Houston in how many weeks? It's never going to rain again. And so the same thing holds true with financial markets, with interest rates. Sometimes it's, it's helpful to look at the perspective of what, quote unquote, real high interest rates are. And, and right now, uh, we're, we're still on a relative basis. We still have very low interest rates compared to history. So what is our economic outlook? There's, there's kind of three outcomes. And if you know which one is gonna happen, please let us know, we'd love to hire you. But 
you'll hear on TV or you'll read about the quote unquote soft landing. The economy might slow down a little bit. Inflation's going to fall, but there's going to be no recession. That is, uh, we would think, possible, not probable. Very few times in history has that played out as being what, what has happened. That's obviously the goal, but, but it's just statistically, historically speaking, uh, not, not a good option if we are going to guess between the three here. Stagflation, the economy will slow, inflation will stay high, and it's almost the worst of both worlds. A recession is, is, is in some ways the second best of the three outcomes here. The economy will contract, but will nip inflation in the bud and, and prices will get back to a more uh, status quo level of what the Federal Reserve and everyone else is hoping for as it pertains to these inflation figures. So overall, we will talk a little bit uh, about our timeline of a recession. And we have a, I wrote a blog that we're gonna send out, I think later this week, talking about this in more detail, but the bottom line is this, we don't see a recession. Well, one can say we're in a technical recession right now and it's hard to argue with that. But with what we talked about earlier, a lot of these, these under the hood financial metrics still look really healthy. Our best guess is maybe the end of 23, sometime the middle of 2024, we see a quote unquote real recession where the consumer essentially says, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to take that trip we were planning. Or instead of going out on a date night to our normal place, let's just, let's make food here at the house to save some money. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to drive to College Station to buy tickets to watch that game. Let's just watch it on TV. Where the, the consumers are now making decisions that are, are withholding money being spent in the economy, that's what we'll, we'll probably bona fide as a quote unquote real, real recession. Uh, bring you back to your linear thinking, 2020 recession, you look at uh, the market, the market was down 30 plus percent in a, just a short few weeks. You look at 2008, 2009, the previous re recession before that, and Market was down 50 plus percent in a period of six months. Outside of some type of uh, black swan event or something that we cannot foresee, uh, we, we think the next recession is more mild. Uh, we don't think it's going to be like a 2008, 2009 recession. We don't think it's going to be like a 2020 type of situation. And the reason for that is the consumer is coming into this recession a lot more uh, financially healthy. So you look at your debt to equity levels and homes, you look at how much money people on average have saved in their bank accounts, you look at 401k values as a percentage of, of debt that each family has, and, and these families are, are in, in really good shape today uh, when compared to a 2007 time frame. I'm reminded of a story that many of you probably remember, there was a strawberry picker in Southern California who was approved for a $1 million loan on a one point something million dollar house. And he was making about $30,000 a year of income. So while, while that's kind of a story that makes your eyes get a little bit bigger, there, there was a lot of that type of activity going on 2006, 2007. And we're just not seeing that right now in the open market. Lenders are still pretty tight, still fiscally conservative, still making what we would consider good decisions on, on lending money. So with that being uh, uh, said, here's a, we thought another good quote, Is the economy in a recession, no, people are unhappy with inflation, which has recently been running at its highest rate since the early 80s. But inflation is not a recession, which is defined by a decline in economic activity. Economic activity is not falling. So it, it, it is, it's a little bit of a tug and pull going back and forth. Uh, we, we think it's, it's prudent in situations like this to, to know what you own, know why you own it, 
We'll talk more here in a minute about dividend paying stocks. Uh, one could make a fairly compelling argument that the next 10 years, stocks are not gonna go up nearly as much as they've gone up over the past 10 years. And if that's the case, dividends are gonna become even more important to the overall, the total return for client portfolios. So let's take a look here at financial markets. Uh, it's the first worst first six months of any year for the past 50 years. We're looking here at the S&P 500, the, the NASDAQ, which is more of a technology focused index and the Dow Jones uh, and, and all three did, did not do well for the first six months. We've seen a, a recovery uh, last few days. We've kind of slipped a little bit from there, but uh, we, we have seen some type of uh, higher movement since the 1st of July. And this, this slide puts into perspective the volatility that we have felt thus far this year. Uh, what I want to do is draw your attention to the, uh, the bar on the right, 2022. There's been 63 moves where the market has been up or down more than 1%. And, and this is just through the first, oh, this data is through May 22nd. So this number is a lot higher now. But just through May 22nd, you're, you're, it looks like third place, the most over the past couple of decades of the amount of volatility we've seen. So this has been an unusual year for volatility. But with that being said, last year was an unusual year with lower volatility. Last year set records for some of the least volatility we've seen in quite some time. Uh, this was a big concern when we were putting this together a few weeks ago. Everyone was talking about and concerned what are earnings going to be for this quarter. And, and a lot of the earnings have come out already for the most recent quarter. But there, there was speculation, the, the, the PE, the price to earnings ratio, they said the E or the earnings component is going to fall off a cliff. And, and we're going to see that. And, and on the contrary, companies have been resilient. Uh, the, the earnings over 70% over of the companies this past quarter not only meet, but beat expectations of, of their earnings. So you're seeing these, these companies find ways to still be profitable, find ways to meet expectations. And uh, like I said earlier, at some point this changes. And our, once again, our best guess, middle of next year, or excuse me, end of next year, middle of 2024, when, when consumers start to kind of pull back in what they're spending, we're just not seeing that, we're not seeing that yet. And it's worth noting about two thirds of the overall economy is derived from spending of consumers. So they're, they're the, the real driving force on can these earnings continue to grow or will they not? And uh, thus far, we're continuing to see them grow. And actually here, the, the estimate uh, for the end of this year, we think some earnings growth still, still continues. Some people love this, this price to earning, these PE ratios. We're not as big of believers that this is the end all be all of how to look at markets just because it's it, it can we can we can kind of make a real compelling argument on the flip side this this portion that is literally off the page here way up here this was march of 2009 the highest pe ratio ever on record and you know obviously March of 2009, when the market was bottoming, was arguably the best time to buy stocks in your lifetime. Uh, with, with the exception of a few quarters, stocks have, have gone almost straight up since, since uh, spring of 2009. So buying stocks when the PE ratio was at its highest, it's kind of a little bit of a head scratcher, but take out some of those, uh, I, I'd say, 
events that are quote unquote not normal. And the, the, the PE ratios can help us determine is the, the overall market expensive, priced well, whatnot. So uh, the, the ratios have gotten a lot more uh, uh, back to normal, I would say, when compared to, to a year ago, still slightly above average. But here's the piece that I think this really doesn't tell the full story. When we look back, and this chart goes all the way back to maybe 1870, really any and all periods of time outside of the past three, four years, interest rates have been substantially higher. So why does that matter? People don't necessarily purchase stocks on an absolute basis. I want to buy this stock because I think it's going to go up. It's more of a relative decision, meaning well, I can buy this stock and it's going to pay me a dividend and hopefully this stock goes up over time. But I do have this bond or this CD here over at the bank and they're guaranteeing a certain rate of return. It's a, it's a give and take. And so when interest rates are low, you really don't have another option but to lift the stocks. And so a lot of these decades, we, you saw much higher interest rates where you had more investment options where now, even with where rates are today, still being low, they are, uh, it would make sense that stocks are a little more expensive with interest rates low. So that's a lot. That's a, we've written about that a number of times. If you have questions on that, that's a great conversation to be had on how interest rates affect stock prices. Uh, here's a, a look at a chart that bear markets do not last forever. That, that is, hopefully those are comforting words in a year like we've experienced thus far. But typically you have a 10% pullback in the market about once a year. And you have about a 20% pullback in the market every two to three years. So we're, we're, we think thus far this pullback has looked very quote unquote normal on what pullbacks look like. Uh, like we said, the consumer is healthy overall. Businesses as a whole are healthy. A lot of cash on corporate balance sheets to, to ride out a storm if and when that storm does come. We like to, to kind of take a step back from the trees, look at the forest. Let's have some perspective here on, on what's going on. Uh, red periods, bear markets, those are bad. Green periods, bull markets, those are good. Uh, hopefully you snickered at that. That part is, is pretty straightforward. But I will draw your attention to this bear market from 1972 to 1981. You had almost a 10 year, or you had a, a this total red period is about 17 years where stocks went up, stocks went down, but stocks ultimately went sideways. And uh, a big, big piece of that was an inflationary environment. So we're not of the opinion that stocks don't move for the next 17 years. We are of the opinion that the, the gains in the stock market probably will be more muted. Thus, we want to rely more on dividend income uh, to, to help that total return aspect if returns are more muted. So there, there's some different opinions on if we are in a bear market, or if this is just a, a pullback within a bull market, typically bull markets, when you look here, they last anywhere from uh, 17 to, to 24 years. And we're of the opinion this bull market started spring of 2009. So if that's the case, we still have a number of years left before the expansion ends. Uh, but with that being said, obviously no two economic periods are are exactly the same. This is a great chart that we will include in a number of presentations just because it, it, is, it is always good to come back to this. What we're looking at here, this is dividend income as a percentage of the total return listed by decades. What is total return? Total return is the, the dividends plus or minus if your stocks grew or shrunk during that decade. 
And so the, the royal blue percentage there is it by decades. But if you look over there on the right-hand side, 41% of the total return of the stock market dating back to World War II has come from dividends, which is not a rounding error, which is a, a material number. Uh, and we would argue that the next 10 years, it's going to be even more important to have dividend income in, in retirement portfolios for, for those that are landing the plane and quickly approaching retirement. So where Randy likes to say he's just a uh, he, he's just an old country boy from East Tennessee. Uh, so with that being said, we, we like to simplify things. And, and when, you, when you take all the noise out of it, what makes stock prices move higher? And it's higher earnings. Companies make more money. And that is done by having a healthy consumer who is willing to spend money. And, and that's oversimplified, we understand that, but at the most basic level, that's what's gonna make stocks move higher. And, and right now, companies continue to increase earnings. And as we illustrated, we think the consumer as of today is still healthy. That will change. Uh, and if you know exactly when that will change, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but please let us know, we'd love to hire you. But uh, we, we say, hey, with that being said, let's block out all the other noise. Uh, things you read on CNBC, things that you hear on TV, they're not necessarily serving as your fiduciary or putting your best interest first. They typically have an agenda, whether that be ratings, whether that be advertisements to sell. And uh, that's, that's not always uh, what is quote unquote best for you and your family. Let's, let's transition here from stocks and look at bonds or fixed income and what the first six months of this year have looked like uh, as, as well. It's been a historic year in the bond market. You can see here, this is the biggest downturn since the early 80s for fixed income as a whole. Uh, and that's large part with the Federal Reserve increasing the, the short-term interest rates. So, uh, we last about two years ago, we positioned our uh, taxable bond portfolio, not for all clients, but one of them, one of the main uh, strategies we utilize to be a little more interest rate agnostic, meaning we want to take less interest rate risk. We continue to feel comfortable with that strategy with where we are, but uh, every every family obviously is is different. Uh, I thought this was a really helpful chart. Uh, Randy and I looking at this stuff every day, every week, it caught both of us by surprise. And what caught us by surprise is let's look at this black line, which are interest rates. And you see here in the 70s up until the early 80s, interest rates moving higher. But what is interesting is you had a lot of green or positive rates of return during those periods with bonds. So we get the question a lot, interest rates are going up, shouldn't we just wait until they, they get higher and then we'll reinvest in the bonds? I, I, in theory, that's a great answer. It's just our crystal ball is a little bit funny, fuzzy on how long they'll move higher. And uh, this, this does illustrate that there have been positive rates of return for bonds, even in rising interest rate environments. Now, this does not factor in inflation. I had a client say, oh, I remember the good old days. I was getting 10% on a CD uh, from such and such bank back in the day. And we say, well, you were getting 10% on a CD. Inflation probably was eight or 9%. And then you were paying tax on all that interest. When you adjusted for inflation, you probably were backing up. So it, it's this does, with the caveat, this does leave out the inflation aspect, but uh, that's that's harder to to really wrap our minds around. Uh, this is this is uh, we think a, a key consideration for how you invest money over the next two, three, four, five, ten years. And the stock market, as we all know, can be volatile. We say it's the price you pay to to build equity in the public markets. 
prices will go up, prices will go down. That's part of it. The bond market is, is typically uh, less volatile and not as emotional. And, and so usually the bond market will, will help us determine in a more uh, level-headed fashion what we think is gonna happen moving forward. What the bond market is signaling or has been signaling really all of this year is, hey, we, we think inflation is high. This is, this is the bond market speaking, not Matt and Randy. We think, the bond, we think inflation is high, but when we're looking out for inflation projections two, three, four, five years down the road, we don't see inflation nearly as high as it is now. And, and there's all these future markets where they're, they're making projections of what the inflation is going to be in these two, three, four, five years from now. And the numbers are a lot lower than the six, 7% we're seeing currently. And so with that being said, the bond market is not, it, it's very, uh, we call it a flat yield curve. And I know that might make some people yawn and want to fall asleep, but hang with me. Short-term interest rates are, are really close the same to medium-term interest rates, really close to the same as long-term interest rates. And, and typically, you you get more interest on a 10-year bond than a one-year bond. Typically, you get more interest on a 30-year bond than a 10-year bond. Right now, it's just super flat. And, and so what the bond market is saying is, hey, we think inflation is going to come down. We think these short-term interest rates will go a little bit lower in the next few years. And maybe the medium and long-term rates creep up a little bit, but they're not, they're not believing that inflation that we see it today is going to be persistent over the next, call it two, three, four years. So, you know, fingers crossed, we, we would love for the bond market to be right in that. That means inflation gets taken, taken down, put under control, but uh, we shall see. And here's a quote, the U.S. yield curve in particular, thanks to the central position of the dollar, the U.S. dollar that is, acts as a barometer for investors' collective wisdom uh, about the future path of the world's largest economy and has a strong record of signaling downturns before they arrive. So thus far, we haven't, it looks, it looks positive of what the bond market I think is signaling at this point. Okay, what might be ahead? War in Ukraine, uh, obviously already here. We think this probably continues for a while. Food shortages, energy shortages, higher food prices and energy prices. I've My example that kind of, it really hit home for me. I typically do the grocery shopping in our house and we buy these little individual uh, oatmeals for our, our three kids. And at Christmas of last year, early this year, it was about a dollar for one of these individual oatmeal deals. And, and just a month or two ago, it was about $1.25. You say, yeah, it, it's a quarter. What's the big deal? It, not, not a whole lot of money. Well, it's not on a per item basis, but as a percentage, it's just 25% increase in the cost of oatmeal. So you're, you're seeing that. We think the food component of it continues uh, for a while. We think energy, uh, prices continue to stay high for, for a while uh, as well. COVID lockdown in China, we've already spoke about this, but we do think this will continue to have ramifications for us here stateside. Uh, just the, the chip shortages we think will, will continue. Uh, and then we think some of those exports of what we're sending to other country, countries are gonna continue to keep that GDP number probably at a muted level as, as China is not purchasing as much as, as they have historically from the US. And possibility of a Federal Reserve policy mistake, we're all human. We'd like to think that uh, the elected government officials, even though the Federal Reserve is not elected, uh, that they don't make mistakes. Uh, I feel like the last few years, regardless of your political affiliation, has been an unwelcoming reminder that that is just not the case. Uh, politicians make mistakes. But the mistake here would be if the Federal Reserve raises interest rates too much, that could tip the economy into a recession, causing these U.S. consumers to spend less 
if they raise rates too slowly, inflation, which can be, you can hear people talk about inflation being sticky, it can stick around for too long and, and prices continue. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. I do not envy Mr. Powell or any other of the Fed chairs who are making these hard decisions. Uh, but we think that is the biggest uh, piece of information that is going to affect bond, bond markets and also stock markets over, over the next uh, couple of quarters, also a couple of years. We are, we're recording this, so we'll, we'll send this all to all clients, a replay. Just for time's sake, I'm going to skip through a few of these quotes. Uh, just we're running a few minutes uh, over that 45 minute level. But here's, we, we did this at our last webinar as well. This is from our first webinar of the year. We said, here, here was our, our thematic trends for 2022. We think inflation's here to stay. We'll, we'll start to dissipate toward the second half of the year. Uh, you're starting to see inflation level off and we're gonna see if it starts to slowly move lower. Think interest rates will rise, not get out of control. That's what we've seen thus far. So far, we've seen American companies continue to increase their earnings. COVID, much less of a big deal than it was Christmas of last year. Uh, you saw Biden's tax plan really fall apart. Uh, we continue to think that there'll be a red wave in November causing more gridlock in Washington, D.C. Uh, the markets actually historically like gridlock, meaning that not too much can get done in either direction more certainty of what the next few years will look like. Health of the economy, uh, 10 of our 12 re recession indicators uh, still look positive. That's slightly come down. There's a few more moderate uh, pieces in there. Uh, and then the geopolitical tensions, it, that's just too unpredictable. So most clients on the phone have done a live well plan. That's an integral part of, of what we do and how we make investment decisions. But we thought it helpful just to, to review that process uh, for, for, for clients and anyone that has possibly not, not uh, completed this. But our goal, and Randy's kind of like an old, old Southern Baptist preacher, he talks about comfort, confidence, and clarity. And, and really, that's our end goal. That's what we're looking for with this planning process. We're trying to take a lot of the minutia, a lot of the noise out of it. And, and see what rate of return does your family need to be successful? And then let's build in what we think we're gonna be spending year over year in retirement, cars, gifts, the grandkids, the big trip y'all been thinking about, whatever it is, uh, and, and see, make sure, give clients this level of confidence, hey, everything's gonna be okay, even when there are pullbacks. Uh, so I love this quote by Benjamin Graham, one of Warren Buffett's mentors, the best way to measure your investing success is not whether you're beating the market, but whether you put in place a financial plan and a behavioral discipline that are likely to get you where you want to go. We think those are wise words, and that's really what our whole planning process is, is founded upon. A component of that live well plan, your family index number, what rate of return do you need to be, quote, successful? Some years we might outperform this, other years we will fall short of this, but we want this to be the long-term average over a market cycle on what your investment portfolio would earn uh, from dividends, from any price appreciation. And, and then we send out some performance reports, at least quarterly, to help you track that progress within your LiveWell plan. And this we'll close with this. It's a good reminder for a lot of clients. Why do we need an investment process? The the green line is the S and P 500, and the lighter shaded green are the inflows of mutual funds or the outflows of mutual funds. And what you can see here is the average retail consumer spent the most they've ever spent on buying equity mutual funds right at the end of 1999, which was arguably the worst time to buy stocks. <clears throat> and they sold at the bottom of 2008, spring or summer of 2008, which was arguably the best time to buy 
stocks uh, in our lifetime. So with that being said, investing is emotional. And, and we realize that our goal is to have a bona fide fact-driven process that takes the emotion out of investing, that puts the law of large numbers in your favor. And our goal, like we've talked about, is to, to isolate companies that pay dividends, but have a propensity to increase those dividends year over year. So we think, especially in retirement, having an investment process is, is very, very, did I say very important. So a few minutes behind, uh, got long-winded on a few slides. Uh, let's see if there, there's a chat box. You can type a few questions. I see we have a few here already. Uh, and then, like I said, email us, call us with any additional questions that you don't want to ask in a public forum. Uh, what about the real estate crisis in China and how will that impact, impact America? That That is a good Good question. Uh, China as a whole, we think is really overbuilt. And you're starting to see this partnership between the Chinese government and a lot of these real estate developers fall apart. So not nearly as strong as it's been in the past few years. Uh, you're seeing a lot of Chinese money flow, maybe more so on the West Coast than here in Houston. But the Chinese government limits their citizens how much they can invest outside of the Chinese government, but one of the caveats or the exclusions is in real estate. So you're seeing a lot of people continue, a lot of uh, Chinese money continue to, to gobble up some, some residential real estate here stateside. So it could continue to prop prices up here, uh, but that, that is a very, very good question. Another question, should I be reviewing my live well plan in increasing or decreasing the percentage in equities? Are there quality stocks that are cheap now? So another good question. I'd say every family is a little bit different. I'm not sure there's necessarily a, a quote unquote right or wrong answer here on increase or decrease, but we are seeing maybe maybe less than change the percentage in equities, we're changing the type of equities. And we want the companies to be a little more defensive, i.e. dividend related value stocks opposed to growth stocks. Uh, and we're looking for companies that not only pay dividends, but can increase those dividends year over year. And so yes, there are some, some companies that are, are cheap as it pertains to, and there's a handful of different ways you can define cheap. Uh, we're, we're, that's, a, that's a component of it, but the, the, the biggest piece is we want to make sure they can continue to increase those dividends. What's interesting are a lot of the oil and gas stocks are still quote unquote cheap, even after a great run they've had this year, but how long do commodity prices stay where they are? And that's kind of the, the harder question to answer. Uh, Question three, how is the velocity of money impacting all of this? Is money supply decreasing, but purchase, if the money supply decreases, but purchasing continues to use up, will use of credit go back up? <clears throat> the velocity of money is definitely decreasing. You see that in the, it used to be monthly, now it's a quarterly figure on, on when the Federal Reserve gives the uh, velocity of money numbers and you've seen that actually slightly move lower here over the past three, four, five months. And will the use of credit come back? That, that's, I don't know. That, that is a good, a good question. I think it depends on the confidence of the consumer would be an easy way to answer that question. If consumers are confident, the answer would probably be yes. If consumers are, are continue to be sheepish, they're probably not going to go out and borrow borrow money to continue to keep spending at the same same level. Here's a question we get a lot. Will the dollar remain the, the world's reserve currency? We think the answer is yes. We say, who else would you look to replace it with? And, and there's not a good answer out there. Probably the best answer, if you wanted to say it's going to be replaced, would be a basket of different currencies. But it, it, right now, we don't think that's likely. We think the U.S. dollar continues to be the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. Uh, the largest social security increase 
since 1981 is being communicated, how does this and any other labor increases that are being demanded allow inflation to wane? Yeah, for those of you receiving Social Security, it's estimated starting on January 1st of next year, you'll get anywhere from a 10 to 11% increase in your payments. Now, you won't see that full amount because Medicare premiums that are typically paid from your Social Security check will also move higher. So part of that will be cannibalized, but you will get the biggest increase in quite some time. This year it was about 6%. Uh, so 10% is the biggest increase in the, since the early, early 80s. Uh, late other labor increases that are being demand allowed to inflation to wane. I, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a correlation with the social security payments and in, in inflation. We think the, the bigger piece with inflation is, okay, we've seen the money supply start to, to creep lower and uh, are, are companies as a whole going to slow down the amount that they're borrowing, the people that they're hiring? Uh, so it, 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 I think we're, we're, we continue to be in uncharted territory, which we would argue is even more important of a reason to have an investment process, know what you own and know why you own it. So I think that's all of them. Uh, like I said, my name is Matt Price. Uh, Randy sends his regards. Any additional questions that you might have, please reach out to us here uh, at the Price Group. We Retirement is really all we do. Uh, this is Tiffany, Melissa, Maddie Kearns as well. And uh, we really appreciate your time. Talk to you soon.